Burp. <clears throat> I'll cut that out. <laughs> or will I? <laughs> I need a drink. My throat is all messed up. That burp really. Yeah, that burp messed me up. Sorry, guys. I'm going to have to call in. <laughs> I burped this morning. <laughs> I burped. My voice is shot. Man, what would that sound like? <laughs> what kind of a burp does it take to... <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. We're keeping this in. Oh. <laughs> Maybe we can attack it on at the end afterwards. <laughs> Bonus content for our Patreons. Yeah, for our Patreons, we get like this really inane babble at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for listening to Games by Design, our podcast where we share our experiences with video games and discuss what is awesome or not awesome. I'm Zach Dunlap, and I'm your host for this episode. I'm joined today by my brother, Nick Dunlap. Hello. And college buddy, Aaron Bone. I am the college buddy. Heck yeah. <laughs> this week's episode is our monthly game highlight episode, where we take a break from our usual format and discuss a single game that we all agreed to play in preparation for this chat. This month's game is Crusader Kings 3 the Grand Strategy and Medieval Life Simulation by Paradox Interactive. Um, for the last four weeks, we've been playing this one together, and there are currently two videos on YouTube of us playing it, and with more coming soon. <clears throat> so we're going to start today's episode by sharing a couple of stories from our time in CK3, and then we'll take turns leading a discussion about this game. We each have questions we're going to pose to each other about our experiences. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start with uh, game experiences with Nicolesh. Okay. So tell us who you were playing as and what happened to you. Sure. Okay, so I was playing as Duke and later King Zidislav of Bohemia. <laughs> yeah. A, a fictional Zidislav. character who I created. Yeah. Uh, the vassal king to the Holy Roman Emperor. That's me. Yeah, that was that was you. Um, he was a... Uh, I, my character, Zidislav, was a, a vengeful and zealous Catholic um, who uh, was fiercely religious and uh, killed a lot of people who weren't, um, <laughs> at least a couple. Uh, but perhaps my favorite uh, story was when I um, was trying to claim new territory and lost a, a war to a, to a neighboring duke and was sent us and I, I was sent a scathing letter by a five-year-old <laughs> telling me how foolish I had been for trying to take his lands. <laughs> this same five-year-old. Five prince. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yep. He was very cute. He's like, how dare you? <laughs> it was great. He's still in his diapers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I, I later on betrothed my daughter to the same five-year-old <laughs> to form an alliance. Um, and when they were married, he was a... He was a very manly man with a very manly mustache. Um, and we became pretty good friends. But then, uh, a year after their marriage, my daughter died of the bubonic plague. And I lost my alliance and also my daughter. So that was pretty tragic. <laughs> so many times. So that's, that's my experience. <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely little personal story of mine. <laughs> I see that you also have a tragedy. <laughs> My story is also a tragedy. <laughs> I think <laughs> well, I'll get to that. I don't yeah. know, maybe that game's that's just what this game is about. I mean, it is about the Middle Ages, so that's pretty tragic happens. times. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's good stuff too. It just this particular one had a, I think, a fun kind of arc to it. So yeah, yeah, that was. I remember <laughs> that was a good story. <laughs> that, that's my experience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Zuxi just had a funny hat and funny ears, and he was just a funny guy. <laughs> he, <laughs> he looked very around. grumpy, and he hated <laughs> everyone. He did, and everyone hated him, yeah. too. Yeah. So he just went around murdering bishops and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> sinful bishops. See, right. He was a zealous Catholic, so when there were these sinful bishops exposed, he took it on himself to cleanse the land of them. <laughs> <laughs> cleanse the church. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> All right, thank you for your experience. <laughs> yeah, not, not even murderous with... bishops, just like, oh, this bishop forgot to tithe, so. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Aaron, who did you play as and, and what happened to him? Yes, yeah, so my character, honestly, my story wasn't as much as a tragedy as uh, some of the others. 
That's but good. my character was a guy by the name of Klaus of the House von Nikolaus. And <laughs> he was a, he was kind of a happy guy, you know, most of the months of playthrough. He was generous, he was a scholar. Um, there were a couple fun moments where he tried to um like do different scholarly things. Like one time he was dabbling in alchemy and tried to create gold out of metal. <laughs> um, and, and there was a side effect to that. It's like, Oh, if this works, I'll be very rich. If it doesn't work, I will have a headache for 10 years. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is quite the headache. So, so that was fun. Um, and then another time that uh, he was working on this translation of Euclid's mathematical <laughs> treatise. That's right. <laughs> and he was reading it to one of his servants and he fell asleep in the middle of it and was like, oh, well, this isn't very interesting. So it's like, it's a mathematical treatise. Like, <laughs> 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 um, but it's funny, I didn't know Klaus uh, von Nikolaus. He had one wife who died of some unknown sickness. She kind of looked sick her entire life. Um, <laughs> but that wife uh, bore Klaus three. Was it three or four beautiful children? Yeah, I think it was um, four. Was a beautiful is a <laughs> arguable. Beautiful term. sons and some frog-like girls. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't sound too sexist. The the character <laughs> model for the little female babies was kind of horrifying at times. Um, <laughs> That's because your guy was homely, right? It was a well, like, uh, Klaus was homely. That is true. Um, but he, he, didn't, it on. he didn't look like a frog or anything. <laughs> He's yeah. just kind of a jolly fat guy with the wrinkles. <laughs> um, but a- anyway, so that's fun. Um, one one of the things that uh, really stood out to me in that game, by the end of the game, I was just surprised and, and kind of uh, impressed by how connected I was to this family and to you know, this court and things that were going on. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. I'd get a little message. It was like, Oh, your, your daughter um, saw this prisoner who wanted water and went and got him water. It's like, Oh, I'm so proud of you. Like, that's great. And, <laughs> and towards the end of the playthrough, my class got a little bit older and my oldest son, Christoph, you know, was becoming a King. It was like, Oh, he'll yeah. be a good King. Yeah. Like, this is a solid son. Like, like it was this family connection through this game that I, that I hadn't experienced before. Um, mm-hmm. And then there was also, all these interesting friendships and politics, uh, you know, going on outside of that um, within, like I had several moments within my council where I had to choose counselors. Um, And in the game, basically, you know, you have counselors and they kind of help you gain money and power and influence. And uh, anyway, I, I had this one guy who I met at Zach, your character's first feast in the game. And he became my best buddy because we really liked, I think long, you know, boring scholarly <laughs> <Mathematical> treatises. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he was in my counselor, and uh, I had this chancellor who I got a letter. It's like, got, your chancellor is very bad at his job, and uh, you need to get rid of him. And so I fired him and then gave it to my best buddy. But then my best buddy was even worse at that job. <laughs> and so <laughs> I had to fire him. And then the only of my vassals, the, you know, people under my influence, who could do that job was the guy I had fired in the first place. <laughs> so then I ended up giving him back his job. And then my best buddy became my steward that he was actually good at. Um, and <laughs> there were just so many moments in that game where it's like, okay, do I want, so what's the balance of having somebody who's competent in this position and somebody, you, you know, who has a lot of influence over me or who likes mm-hmm. me and like, how do I balance that? And, and I just hadn't, you know, had a really game experience dealing with those kinds of politics. Yeah. Um, and it was fun. By the end of the game, my best buddy was like in charge of the Duchy of Holland. And like the council had gone through several different iterations and people. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, it's just, you're just taking like 50 years of experience and, you know, putting it in a few hours of gameplay. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember, wasn't it? What is his name like, Lutberg or Lutier or something like that? Your buddy? Uh, yeah, it was. It was Mayor, um, like Lutenberg. Yeah, I, I can't remember, but but yeah, 
I remember hearing about him in episode in the first uh -huh. session, and then you know, came up again and again, coming up over and over again. He's still story. around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He outlived you. Yeah, <laughs> he did. He's fun <laughs> recurring characters that like. Yeah. Yeah, and there was Boravage in your court, who was just like Boravage. Some, yeah. Yeah, just some random guy. guy who came to my court, and then I made him a knight, and then he started leading my armies and became my marshal, and yeah. uh, died in battle. <laughs> wow. A bummer. Yeah. Hey, he lived like he he died like he lived, you know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he was old too. He probably would have died soon after anyway. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> at least he died doing what he loves. Question mark. <laughs> he loved, uh, Kelly he was people. good at it. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Doing his job. Mm -hmm. But he, he had a good career. He came up in the world and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Zach, what was your experience? Yeah, yeah, my experience. Well, I played um Eckbert von Bonbon bon of the Holy <laughs> of the Holy Roman Empire. I was the Holy Roman Emperor uh, to both of you guys. You guys are my vassal kings. Mm -hmm. And um, I forgot his name was von Bonbon. Bon. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny when it was his son, his heir. You know, because his his son was Herman, and I just think Herman's a funny name. And so, and 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 at least was sitting next to me, you know, watching me play this game. And every time I clicked on him, she'd go. <laughs> Herman von Bonbon. Bon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yeah. And so I, I didn't really think about the naming conventions. I just kind of went with what it gave me and I was like, well, that's, that's pretty silly. <laughs> but, um, so, uh, I was, a uh, expert of the orange eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, he was kind of a more diplomatic, gregarious, calm, even keeled kind of ruler. Mm -hmm. Um, he was all about making alliances and stuff because he wanted to, you know, secure his position in the world and everything. Yeah. Um, he also showed um, some unusual favoritism towards two of his dukes, <laughs> <laughs> which was you guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then made him kings pretty much unnecessarily. But I wanted you guys to have more to play with. So yeah. <laughs> I made you guys kings. <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> so my, my story is kind of tragic. Um, early in the game, I had two kids. The first one was a girl. Her name was Hildegard. And I needed alliances, so I set up a marriage between Hildegard and this guy, Sven, from, like, Denmark or something. Mm -hmm. He looked like a Viking. Um, he probably was a Viking. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> his father had a lot of armies and stuff, and I needed the deal, you know. So yeah. I made this deal when they were both, like, little kids. And, like, I barely knew Sven, and I barely knew my own daughter, but we had a betrothal, and then uh, – and. And I had an alliance, and so I could call in the armies anytime I wanted. It was great. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they grow up, they become adults, they come of age, they get married, um, and uh, and they go off to Denmark or wherever. I don't even remember where he's from. I think it was Denmark. They go off to Denmark to hang out or whatever. So I didn't hear about them for a long time after that. I just you know I just check in every once in a while and oh what, what's my what are my kids doing? So I click on Hildegard and see what she was doing, but. Um, it turned. I found out that um, she cheated on her husband at one point, <laughs> <laughs> and and had a kid with somebody else. I don't even remember who it was. Somebody, some nobody. Mm -hmm. um, and so this and this poor daughter that she had is gonna, you know, she's gonna grow up and be like a bastard, and that's a big deal in this society that we're yeah. in, you know. And so she's gonna have a terrible life, and so that was that was pretty sad. But that's not even that's not even the worst part. The worst part was that. Um, my son-in-law, Sven, <laughs> was this jerk. <laughs> and he was a vengeful, sadistic dude. And so he had my daughter, his wife, thrown into prison, where he then tortured her for a few years. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I, I couldn't do anything about this. I was totally powerless to stop this from happening um, mm -hmm. until Sven decided that he had had enough fun, and then he executed her. So... <laughs> I was furious, and I felt like like some paternal failure. I guess I don't know. I'd set because I, I I was responsible for this, you know. Like I'd set up the the marriage and everything, and like I I could have done better at picking a husband, I guess. And I don't know. I just, <laughs> uh -huh. but yeah. I, but I was Viking. Yeah. Well, no. Yeah. Never betrothed <laughs> to a Viking. What have we learned, gentlemen? <laughs> Principles to draw from this game: Don't marry the bite. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was so I was so angry that I promised uh, Nick over here, who was playing King Zetaslav and the veteran murderer. Yeah, I was. 
very skilled at my job. Yeah, he was I, good was, at... I was the spy master of the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah, he was my spy master. Yeah, um, and um, I, 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 I told you I'd pay you if he, if he, uh, if you killed Sven. But Sven died of natural causes within a year. So uh, after three attempts on his life by me, which all failed. <laughs> <laughs> So that, that was my experience. It was this poor woman that I felt really bad about sending off to her torture and then eventual death. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was my daughter and I felt like I'd failed and it was sad and I thought about, thought about that for a while. <laughs> uh -huh. And then later my whole family and I were killed by peasants in a, in a peasant's revolt and it was terrible. <laughs> that was terrible. <laughs> so. You had so many peasant uprisings. I know. I wasn't handling them very well. <laughs> I should have been doing better with that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's over now. We all eventually died, and mm -hmm. Zug Zedislav, Duke Zedislav, King Zedislav, yeah. excuse me, uh, outlived the rest of us. Yep, I died. <laughs> I think I drank myself to death. So I think he did. died. He drank yeah. himself to death. Mm. Aaron Klaus died of old age. Um, yeah, he was just old. Yeah, and then I was murdered by peasants, and Zedislav drank himself to death. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So um, I was also very old. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we were all quite yeah, old when that happened. Yeah, fun. <clears throat> fun to see the end of all of their lives. Yeah, had grandchildren. So, uh, and... yeah, yeah, he had some greats even in some cases. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. a good, 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 good game. Delightful playthrough. We think it spanned about fifty years or something. I don't remember. But... Yeah, we started. Yeah, and we were. Oof. It was probably it was forty forty or fifty years I yeah. think, in game. Time. I think my character was thirty five when we started the game. Oh, I think, oh that sounds right. I think mine was yeah. too. No, my guy was in his twenties. Then yeah, lived to be about like almost eighty or something like that. Mm. So yeah, yeah wow. A question: Can you start? I mean, I guess you can if you just started the game as like a kid, and then you grew up and took over like a kingdom, and then I think you could. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you can. <laughs> pretty sure that'd, you be, can. that'd be kind of crazy. That'd be kind of fun. Yeah. yeah, you'd have other people making decisions for you. I think for yeah. a long time. I yeah, think I don't know. That's kind even... of the way the second one worked. How would you play? Would the uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> interface be different? It's like, oh, you can choose who to make friends with, and <laughs> random kid <laughs> events happen to you. I don't know. <laughs> I actually, I, I do remember. I, I was playing in this game previously. Um, my first playthrough in Ireland and I and I at one point my character died and my heir was a child. So I played as a child for a few years before he became the king. Mm -hmm. And it had like these events pop up where um I think I still had pretty much control over my my kingdom and stuff like that somehow. But I also had like these kid specific events that would pop up. Oh yeah. Like it it, it like presented this option to me one time where I could choose what my sexuality was going to be <laughs> when I when I became a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> And um, and I say, ooh, I like boys. I like girls. I like boys and girls. And you know, it was, it was silly, but um, because I don't think that's the way that works in real life. <laughs> I think you kind of, I don't, I don't know how it works in real life, but I don't think that's how it works. Um, <laughs> but uh, the um, but you know, like there's like I find a cat in the gardens one day, and I get to name it, and it becomes my new best friend, and then it dies when I reach teenager, and it was sad anyway. So. Oh, so you can so have are. pets all thrown into your tragic story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you just, just a couple more child tragedies to add to the uh, <laughs> list of tragedies <laughs> that you are sure to experience. Yep. It's, 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 got, it's got its ups and downs. Yeah, I mean... Okay, I, Strikes and gutter bombs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, I highlighted the tragedy, but my character's life was mostly happy. Yeah. After he killed the bishop, he went on to change his life and like became yeah. a family man and had a lot of children. My wife and I had a great relationship. So like there, there's a lot of good stuff. It's not all bad. Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah. But anytime there was a sinful bishop, <laughs> back in. I keep trying to leave. I keep getting pulled back in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was a good game. Thank. Mm -hmm. I I really enjoyed playing it with the three of us together too. That was just great. It's a good. Time. <laughs> it was a good time. Mm -hmm. That was great. I, I was talking about before. I I don't know if I would have gotten as into it or would have even really been able to get past the tutorial if I wasn't playing with you guys <laughs> and able uh -huh. to share the experience I was having in real time um, and have some of the decisions I was making, you know, be this joint venture with, with 
with the two of you, with people I know. Like, if it was just playing with a bunch of AI, I, I don't know if I would have gotten as invested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I feel kind of similarly. I think that, I mean, I've never played it by myself, but except for in the tutorial, I guess, but like having it be a shared experience, I think made a, a big difference. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I loved playing together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe next time we'll do it uh, as Vikings or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we can be the people to kill and torture the Emperor's daughters. Yeah. And... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the other perspective, get, gain some empathy for these bloodthirsty yeah. guys, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we should get to the discussion portion of our, of our thing today. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll go first, and then we'll go with, what did we say, uh, Aaron and then Nick and... Mm -hmm. So, okay, so I'll ask my questions first, and then when my time's up, we'll go to Aaron. But um, we touched on this a little bit, but uh, here's, my, here's my, my bit. The characters in this game, uh, they consist of basically a handful of personality traits, and the things that they do are largely random. Um, you don't have written characters in the same way that you do when you're playing a narrative game like all those other games that we keep talking about like the witcher or the last of us or i don't know any of them you know crash bandicoot mm -hmm. so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah we all seem to have like npcs that we all were very attached to and cared about we all had allies friends enemies all this kind of you know uh -huh. <clears throat> so my question is my, i have a, a couple of quick things but my question is like what made you guys care about these procedural people what what why did you care about them you know we got invested like aaron said mm -hmm. why how what happened you know yeah hmm i think for me some of it was kind of the random procedural element to it mm -hmm. uh the fact that you know this person who became my best friend he just showed up out of my control at this feast we had like one dialogue option of whether to continue talking or stop talking. And then from that point on, you know, he was one of my vass vassals and he was in my council. Like it wasn't just, I don't know if it would have just been a thing like, Oh, let's look at this guy's characteristics and choose to be friends with him. Um, you know, which there was some in that game too, but I, I was really delighted by these things just totally out of my control that happened. Like I, I didn't choose mm -hmm. to do a translation of Euclid, just all these little <laughs> <laughs> things of yeah. my character, you know, my character traits that I kind of developed based on my decisions or based on what I chose. And it just happened to be this event. And it was like, okay, let's, let's go with it. So, so there was kind of this natural thing of some kind of spontaneous world event happens or, or something mm -hmm. Yeah, just out of your control that you then react to that that felt a lot like real life. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that real life just things kind of happen and you choose how you react to them. And, you know, sometimes yeah. it's based on how you've acted in the past or who you are or the relationships you've made. And, and sometimes they just come out of the blue. Um, but then, and those things then that are out of your control can become a huge part of who you are. And I think the game reflects that really well. And, and how it takes these random procedural events and then allows you to build off of those in a meaningful way. Yeah. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah. It's, 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 so it's, a lot of it is because it's out of your control, which is kind of mm -hmm. an interesting thought, it sounds like. I know, yeah. Because, like, you know, the last few weeks we're talking about, I need to be able to make choices. This, uh -huh. I need to have my agency, you know. And, and that's, a, cause that's interesting, though. Because, uh -huh. you know, like... Yeah. 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 I was actually taking some notes earlier today as I was thinking about some of my experience with this. It's funny that this is almost exactly something that I wrote. Um, but in answer to this question, I, I became super invested on in all the characters. And I think a reason that that was for me was because I knew that our people were unique. Like these people only exist in this reality. No mm. one else is going to have this story. And so in like a kind of a weird way, it made me feel responsible for seeing how it played out because I knew that no one ever, el no one else <laughs> ever would. I'm the only person with my per unique perspective, like watching this unique game unfold, um, which I thought was really cool. Um, yeah, that's so true. This was a wholly unique experience. Nobody else playing this game was going to have this exact same experience or e even close to it. Um, yeah. 
that the the interactions that we had, our characters were complete, were entirely our own. Um, you know, the the choices and the things that we did with it was entirely our own in the setup. So it's yeah. kind of this this special ephemeral ephemeral moment in, in this game it was like this mm-hmm. is all ours. You know, this is uh, this is our game. This is our experience. Yeah. We're not yeah. just playing the script um, that someone else wrote. We're creating our own, and we're yeah, moving that along. That that, that is that is incredibly unique and special. Yeah, uh, that's really cool. But yeah, you're right. Like nobody else who plays Crusader Kings three ever and ever mm-hmm. is going to know Duke Klaus, Duke Zetislav. Emperor Von Bon Bon, Expert Von Bon Bon, um, and the stories that they got involved in, and nobody else is going to encounter all the fun NPCs that we encountered. Yeah, you know? nobody's going to know yeah. Boravage or Mayor Lutberg or whatever his name. You know, mm-hmm. they were our characters, our friends, and nobody else's. You know. Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, that's crazy. It's it's, it's nuts. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and it reminds me of what we were talking about. Um, I guess it was last uh, last time, or uh, I don't know. One of the episodes we were talking about interacting with the world, and you know when mm-hmm. a game gives us feedback <clears throat> versus when we have to kind of create our own stories. And, and in yeah. a way, Crusader Kings, you know, allows you to create your own stories, but then it still gives you feedback and consequences for the choices you make. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it does a really good job with that. Yeah, yeah, um, and. I- Sorry, keep going there. Yeah, but it's like, you know, if it was, it's like, oh, well, you can create your characters, but it's it's still, and if you want, you can pretend like they're best friends with this person or that, you know, they had this relationship or, you know, you can have this procedure that helps you get more invested in the game. But in this actual game, mm-hmm. those are choices that you make that then you don't have control over what that leads to. Um, yeah. And that gives mm-hmm. a satisfying you know, play in response with the game, that the design of the game is working with your imagination um, and able yeah. to take your creative input and give you uh, an, un, you know, uh, a, a result uh, that's, you know, something that only the game could give you. Yeah, it's it like, it gives you the unpredictability that your imagination itself can't provide. Like it gives yeah. you the surprise yeah. and a fresh experience. Yeah. Like, but but you also have the beauty of your imagination. Like so much of what was exciting about this was telling our stories to each other and going, yeah. oh wow, that happened. I, I wonder why that happened and like filling in a lot of these gaps. Yeah. But there was also yeah. so much there already. Yeah. No, oh, I like that a lot. That's cool, guys. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um so in these next couple of follow-up questions hopefully help expand on this. Mm-hmm. But uh this next one is um, how did your feelings about the characters in Crusader Kings 3 differ from the feelings that you've had about characters from other games that have scripted dialogue, voice performance, stuff like that? Mm-hmm. You know, So like we're talking about procedural, systemic, random stuff happening and getting attached to it. Um, how, how is it different? Um, yeah. Yeah. Your experience. How was your experience different between those two types of things? Mm-hmm. I think again for me it came from all the unpredictable moments like I think a little bit in those times um, you know and you can kind of see this in the playthrough uh, if the game's paused or things are slowing down um, and you're just kind of going through your vassals or going through your court and just making decisions I didn't feel as much of a connection to the story or the character in the game like that felt like a lot of kind of uh busy work or, or maintenance kind of in between the mm-hmm. game for me it was it was those moments uh yeah it was those little in-game moments that would just pop up or uh you know things that would happen like oh your wife has a baby you know and here's a baby and then the baby's growing up and you can choose you know who's going to educate it and that kind of mm-hmm. you know and how that's all influenced um like it was I don't know, because as, we, as we've talked about, the uniqueness of the characterization in the story is, is incredible. Um, and it's something mm-hmm. that you can't mm-hmm. replicate. 
Um, but there's also a bit of a detachment in some of the gameplay, I think, uh, in that, like, you're this character, but you're also kind of managing this character, or that you're, um, I don't know, there, there were moments in the game, and I think particularly outside of the things that were happening, where I was very conscious of me as the player, somebody at the computer, just mm-hmm. managing these resources and this world, uh, mm-hmm. that felt a little detached from this character that I created that I was going into. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas some other games, while it might not have the same unique experience, um, you know, if it's a if it's a narrative-driven game, or, mm-hmm. you know, some kind of uh you know game where you're following or if it's first person you are this one character through this story uh i, I think the immersion is, is is a little more there and you feel more consistently connected um does that make sense it's yeah. kind of it engages with you in a different way than a game where your first person walking around a house might engage with you yeah yeah, yeah. it's um yeah. Yeah, it's it's more about the the kind of larger picture rather than just focusing on this on this individual character. I, I guess is maybe a better way of saying it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting because like, yeah, I, I know what you mean. When when I was when I was playing, I didn't feel like I was Zeta's love. I felt like I was controlling and had a hand in Zeta's love's life. Mm-hmm. I was and I was okay with that. Like I actually really enjoyed that. Um, you know, I was happy for Zeta's love when he and his wife finally became friends because at yeah. first she hated him. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> pretty, uh, yeah. Um, it's funny. But, um, and I was, you know, I was happy when they, they were able to build a happy relationship. I didn't feel like it was my relationship, but I also didn't care, like, mm. that much. Like, I was invested in this character. Um, and I felt like I was kind of partway a storyteller. And I, like, had a say in what he did, but he was not me. Uh, and that's, I, I was okay with that. Like, um, it engages me on a different, in a different way than like a game where, like, I don't know, than, than a game, I, I don't know that I can really point to a, a specific example, but, uh, but I still found it engaging uh, and immersive even in its own way. Like I was immersed in the story. I was immersed in um, different elements. I wasn't immersed in his perspective necessarily, mm-hmm. but I was immersed in, this world and like we said before it, the ephemerality of it and like yeah. the the uniqueness of it and there was so much that i was immersed in yeah but just it, different yeah yeah because like if you play a naughty dog game for example you know the uncharted or last of us or whatever like mm-hmm. maybe there's less to the imagination when it comes to the characters mm-hmm. than in a game like this which you know yeah, of course, there's less to the imagination. You actually have animation, you know, yeah. and, um, and voice performance and, yeah. and dialogue, which you don't have in this and game. And they move, yeah. Yeah, and they move. <laughs> <laughs> These characters move. I mean, you got little um, soldiers that walk across the map. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> you know, we'll, get, we'll get into combat later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's, it, it is different. It's it's really different. I think that I like both mm-hmm. a lot. Um, maybe just to wrap up my segment here, if we could come up with maybe some strengths and weaknesses of the Crusader Kings approach, because mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. I only got like maybe four or five minutes left before we need to move on. But uh, yeah, for sure. But yeah, no. Um, if you guys have any strengths weaknesses that this game's characterization has that it might have uh, versus other games, I'd love to hear it. I, I do have it. A- with that that kind of answers your last question okay also, i think ties into this um, okay go ahead and that's you're asking what i think it does that maybe you know more scripted games don't do mm-hmm. well with the procedural stuff and this is i think the strength of it is that i got to interact with characters on my own terms mm. like i didn't have to wait for a prompt to try to become friends with somebody mm. i didn't have to like wait for a prompt to educate my child i just i could do this whenever i wanted to and so like every moment became a decision because indecision was a decision because time is passing and mm. like, things are happening yeah. and anytime i choose to do one thing 
it's at the expense of, you know, like dozens of other options that you have. I could be waging a war or I could be spending time with my wife or I could be trying to lose weight or throwing a feast yeah. or calling a hunt or trying to appoint new vassals or whatever. And so since I got to kind of set the terms and I had so much control over when I did what, yeah, um, I thought that was really cool. Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, it mm -hmm. gave me a really cool sense of agency and like my choices mattered in this world. And it just made me constantly think about what I was doing and how it would affect things. Yeah. Wow, that's so interesting. Yeah, it doesn't exactly like let you um, coast. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, okay, I'll just like do this walking segment in this game and then I'll get back to, you know, the shooting or whatever. The thinking, like, yeah. <laughs> the shooting and the thinking, yeah. yeah. No, it's just like, yeah, you're right. It's yeah. constant. No, I like that. Yeah, time marches on, you know, <laughs> regardless of whether you're doing something or not. And that in and yeah. mm -hmm. of itself has effect. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a strength because it feels like my choices really, really matter. Mm -hmm. um, like the consequences are everywhere. I think that's awesome. And I think that's something that you just can't really do as well in like uh, more scripted stuff. Yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? Record every conceivable line of dialogue yeah. ever? Yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> good morning. Good evening. Good. You know, like just <laughs> for whatever time of day you could talk to somebody and whatever's been happening earlier that day or whatever. Yeah. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> Maybe you could use like a text to speech software and <laughs> <laughs> kind of like what. Yeah. That'd be weird. That'd be so. <laughs> Maybe you could do um, that in a game that's like about computer people or something. I don't yeah, know. But yeah, I mean, anyway. I mean, there are. There is scripted things in the game. There, there yeah. are, yeah. Um, you know, kind of these canned responses from certain situations mm -hmm. that are repeated, yeah, again mm -hmm. and again. Uh, but I think because of the, you know, variety in which you can reach those conclusions, and that it comes from your own personal decisions, I think, you know, it still works. Mm -hmm. um, and all of all of those things are governed by systems too, and so like, yeah, yeah, yeah system uh one thing that that frustrated me about the game sometimes is so you have basically kind of two areas of interaction in the game you have the map and then you have your little boxes of different systems and different things going yeah. on mm -hmm. and there are several moments where i need to make a decision based off of information in two of those things and i can only hmm. see one of them at a time oh <laughs> um and so there were a few moments where it's like okay oh i think this would be a good alliance where is this alliance located okay let's well, right. okay well i see them on the map well now it's not you know showing me you know where where they were on a map okay so we'll so see you know it's like okay is this alliance that's far away or is it close by because i had alliances that were far away that would go to war and then by the time I got there, the war would be over. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, making these decisions or, uh, or, you know, moments. Um, uh, okay. Investigate secrets, pull up this person. And now, you know, pull and try to find on the map. I mean, usually, you know, it'd work around, but that would be, I don't know, a bit of a moment where there are a few times where the info I needed was obscured by this other thing I was doing. And it seemed yeah. like whatever I got mm -hmm. out of it, I then didn't, have uh, all the info I need to make that decision. Uh, and, and maybe, I don't know, maybe that was just me not understanding all of the intricate things in the game. Maybe I could have had a different view or something. Um, but there were a few times it was like, okay, pull up this character thing and okay, half the world is blocked. And I can't, <laughs> I, can't <tell> <laughs> mm -hmm. I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, we could talk about Paradox user interface for a very long time, I think. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> But uh, but I but I think that's it for my segment. Unless you guys had any wrapping up thoughts about the systemic characterization or anything. Uh, I loved it a lot. I yeah. loved a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good time. I like it. Yeah. But okay. Yeah, definitely mm -hmm. a unique experience for sure. Yeah. So unique. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll move on to Aaron. You get to lead the discussion segment for the next. 25 minutes or so. Okay, great. Uh, I had a few questions in mind. Um, I guess we'll, we'll start with this one because it kind of relates to what we were talking about with the systems and the different things. Uh, so my mm -hmm. first experience with the game, um, I mean, I guess all of our first experience with the game, but the tutorial for this game, I think I thought was very... 
I know, very unique, very effective in what it did. Like even by, I don't know, the end of the tutorial, I was like, oh, I kind of understand this game. I didn't really get it until we started playing. Right. Um, but I don't know, just how it was set up, um, I, I thought it worked. So I just kind of want to talk about what was it about this tutorial, maybe compared to some other tutorials and games um, yeah. that was mm -hmm. effective. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Nick. Go ahead. Uh, it's been a long time since I've played these Okay. Um, I know this is something you're excited about, so I figured it is the nested tooltips. Yeah. <laughs> and I figured I wanted you to talk about that because I know you're really excited about those. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited about them too, but I think you, yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, nested tooltips. So, you know, like you hover over the, the text in a in a thing or whatever. So tooltips, you know, you hover over an option or something, it'll show a little box explaining that concept to you. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and there's like certain words that are highlighted. And if you hover over those words, another little thing will open up, you know? So like it says, um, in order to make a pie, you need blackberries, you know? And you're like, pie, I wanna click on this, I wanna make a pie. So you hover over the pie option, it tells you about the blackberries in this tooltip. Then you're like, hmm, blackberries, that's highlighted. Hover over the blackberries. And then it says, blackberries are a plant. And then you can hover over the plant and then it takes you to, a, this oh, is what that. plants are, yeah. Uh -huh. And that's not something that's in the game. I'm just, you know, making up this thing. But like, the fact that you could always get more information through those nested tooltips, but it was never more than you looked for or wanted. Yeah. I thought that was great. Like the tutorial taught you the minimum you needed, but everything was there and really easy within reach for yeah. when you wanted to learn more. And it was really accessible and really easy to find. Too. Yeah. Like, like if I needed to figure out where an army was, I could just click on any any military anything. Mm -hmm. And then just I would I knew I could follow a, a rabbit hole of wiki links basically to get yeah. me there. Um, and so it was really easy to find anything, any info I needed about the game. Yeah. But it's also optional. Like you don't have to dig into all of that stuff to understand how to play the game yeah. fundamentally. And, it, and big... it's still there once you get into the game. That it's not, mm -hmm. okay, here's a tutorial. Hope you remember everything. Yeah. Off you go. That you can still highlight those words and it'll give you an explanation and it'll be like, oh, that's, oh, I remember we did this thing with vassals in the tutorial. That's right. Yeah. Okay. What are, oh, that's what they are. Okay. So, um, like I had moments during the tutorial, you know, it's telling me to do something. It's like, okay, like I, I appreciate how succinct and clear this is, but I don't understand why it's important. Um, uh -huh. and, and so mm. then I got into the game and I was like, oh, this is an important thing I need to do. And mm. What is it? Uh, oh, that's what it is. Oh, and I remember the tutorial now that, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. It's so accessible. Like, there is an encyclopedia in the game where you can look anything up. But, like, having to open up a big menu every time you have a stray thought about something is a little challenging. But to have everything right there, like, just to mouse over. Yeah. It's, it's so easy to get knowledge. And so you, you never have to look anything up on the internet. Like, you never have to open a new tab <laughs> and go, how does this work in? Crusader Kings 3, it's right there. Everything is there and it's, it's so easy. accessible. Yeah. yeah. Also, I, 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 I agree with that. I love the, that. Um, I also like that, I think the tutorial is effective because there was just a lot of restraint, I think, in putting that tutorial together. Because, you know, we've all been through tutorials that it's like, oh my goodness, just end already, you mm -hmm. know? Or let mm -hmm. me do something, you know, where it just like talks at you like the whole time. And you've then... never played a video game before. Here's a tutorial. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it also, like, it, it does. It gives you like the broad strokes and and the and the uh, the bare necessities. And then it's like, you know what? Yeah, it, the best way to learn this is to play the game. So go go play the game now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if I if I can just offer a bit of a stark contrast from a, a recent game um, I've been sure. playing. So in Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven. Mm -hmm. I feel like it gives you a tutorial for things that if you played a video game, you pretty much know how to do. Yeah. And then all the other weird, unfamiliar, complicated systems, it'll have little pop-ups <laughs> in your interface that then disappear before you can really read them. 
so many times like okay i'm doing this tutorial that's completely separate from the game in this little virtual reality world that's like oh here's how you duck here's how you shoot here's how you sell and move around it's like okay uh -huh. like that's pretty intuitive and mm -hmm. then it's like oh and then here's this complicated hacking system and it's like okay what do i do and a little box will pop up and it's like okay so to hack to go it's gone. Wait, where where to go? Okay, <laughs> the tutorials in the menu. The tutorials aren't in the menu, and so then I just have to figure <laughs> out, you know, how to do this thing. Or or then in the game, yeah. I'll be in an action, uh, a shootout, and I'll pick up a gun that responds differently to these other guns, and something will pop up about that type of gun, and then it'll disappear. And in the middle of not, a shootout. <laughs> yeah, in the, it's just uh -huh. like okay, what was different about that gun? I want to know what was different. Like, how can I mm -hmm. how can I learn that? Um, yeah. And so being able to see the contrast with this game of after the tutorial, after it originally teaches you, you can always go back in and find that information about that system again uh, mm -hmm. is is incredibly useful. Um, yeah. And uh, I appreciate it. Uh, another game, Horizon Zero Dawn, would have uh, video tutorials for each weapon and then also a quest mm -hmm tutorializing each new weapon that you got. Mm. And so you could do that quest and learn the weapon, but even if you forgot, then you got a little video that showed you how to use each weapon. So Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so I think, yeah, tutorials in the game are, are really important. I think we're, we're seeing, with so many complicated systems in Crusader Kings, how important it was that they had that info accessible at all times. Yeah, I think that's one of my favorite things to take away from this, is that they recognize that the tutorial that you're not done learning the game when you're done with the tutorial. Mm. And that information is still available to you throughout the rest of the game. Um, yeah. And it's not just available. You don't have to go digging through a menu to find it. It's accessible. It's, they know you'll have questions. And so they just have answers ready, not in the way, like, but just around the corner. Like they're, they're right there for you. Uh, and I really like that it expects you to continue to ask questions. Um, yeah. It has like reference, easy reference. Um, I like that. I think that's awesome. I, I think a couple of takeaways that I'm kind of getting here is that I, I think that, um, like Nick was just saying, like managing the expectations of the tutorial designer, mm -hmm. um, you know, because like like you just said, you can't teach the whole game in a tutorial. No. <laughs> the, the game itself is a learning process. That's what play is all about, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and And I think that's important. Also, I think bite-sized manageable chunks mm -hmm. of of information and stuff is important mm -hmm. um and i think crusader kings does a pretty good job of that it you know it, it throttles itself and then slows down doesn't dump everything on you all at once it's like here's a little bit of stuff and then and then it, it uses it in conjunction with this other thing that i think is really important which is it needs to be hands-on mm -hmm. um I, I think that um as much as possible, having a hands-on learning experience um, at the beginning of a game helps to, it really helps to get me to understand how to use it, you know, because mm -hmm. I've been, because I'm using it in the tutorial. Yeah. You know? Maybe it's a protected area that I, you know, that my mistakes don't matter as much, but like it lets me experiment and then learn how to do it. And then, okay, I'm ready. Teach me something new. It teaches me something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also love, sorry, Aaron, we you had to refine that. Continue. Oh, yeah. Kind of Okay. I also love that the tutorial just extends into the rest of the game. Like mm -hmm. it's like, all right, tutorial's done. You can keep playing this world if you want to. Yeah. And so it kind of just kind of sets up it kind of sets up the expectation that this is the way it's just gonna go. Mm -hmm. Is you're gonna continue learning and you're gonna continue experimenting in, in every game that you play. And um yeah, I think yeah. that's really cool. I like that it lets you keep going and, and yeah. I just think it's nice. Yeah, my first playthrough was I just picked up at the end of the tutorial and kept playing for several generations. Yeah. You know, <laughs> became the empire of, of Britannia. And it was, yeah, to, to, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. And was there um, a little bit after that tutorial? Because I will say with our experience, you know, Nick and I, we had the tutorial and then we had the Zach tutorial after <laughs> that. <laughs> mm hmm where we yeah. could just ask you questions and, you know, you kind of helped us out with the game. Um, yeah. So I think so you're the probably the one that had the pure tutorial to gameplay experience. Um, was it a little rough for like the, the first little bit after the tutorial or, or how was that transition for you? Um, well, I mean, like I had played the second game 
um, which I think is more obtuse <laughs> and more difficult to read. Um, and uh, so I think I had a little bit of a background there that helped because um, it's a lot of the same systems, you know. Um, also, uh, I think that kind of it's still rough. Um, that game has so much to it that after, you know, I don't know how many hours I've sunk into it. Not that many, you know, compared to other people who play mm -hmm. grand strategy games. But um, but I, I was playing the game with you guys, and you'd be like, how do you do this? And I'm like, I, I, I have no idea, actually. <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> uh -huh. So, um, yeah, I don't know. But, but I do think that this game has, it's just, it's... Um, it's smooth. It it it, it lets you. Uh, I think that the um, current situation tab helps a lot. Mm -hmm. It like guides you and gives you suggestions constantly. And then yeah, you know, I think that thing really helps. It's part of the main gameplay too. It's not a tutorial mechanic. Mm -hmm. It's just part of the main game, and it kind of acts as a little advisor, giving you suggestions the whole way through. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and because it kind of has a bit of a. An an infinite continuation with it. I mean, assume I don't, if you don't have an heir, do you have to restart or? Uh, if you, yeah, if you don't have an, if your dynasty dies out, then uh, the game's over. Game's mm -hmm. over. Okay. But it has this potential to just kind of keep going. And so if there's a system, maybe you didn't focus on, uh, you know, one time as you continue to play the game, you know, you're pretty free to do different things or learn different things at different times in the mm -hmm. continuation of that experience. Yeah. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, a new game plus or a different playthrough. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, now that I know this, I can, I can do this more. Um, you know, for example, with uh, The Witcher 3, I got to the basically the end of the game before I really understood how the card game worked. <laughs> <laughs> and then by that point, my cards are terrible and everyone I'm playing mm. against is really good. And so I was like, Oh, I want to play this again and like actually invest in this card game a little bit because it's kind yeah. of fun and engaging, but I had to, mm -hmm. you know, almost go back to that. But this one, it's, uh, I don't know if you're like, Oh man, I never held a feast this time. I can hold a feast or, uh, I'm didn't really do much with going to war. So uh, now, I, you know, I can just do that, you know, continue on my next era or, you know, whatever happens. Um, yeah. So it's like almost like the whole game's kind of a trial and error tutorial. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, or continuation kind of thing. Um, with that being said, one of the uh, systems that didn't really click for me and that I found myself continually confused and frustrated by <laughs> was the combat. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to. <laughs> know your guys' take on that. What was your experience? If it was just my inexperience that caused it to be frustrating, or if you think it could have been improved? Hmm. Well, I, too, had struggles with the combat. And so you ended up losing to, to a, a five-year-old. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and ultimately, I, I got a little bit of a better handle on it. It helped when I started recruiting mercenaries, interestingly. Um, but uh, What I kind of came to learn about the combat was it's the difficulty is kind of front loaded. You have to know everything before you declare the war. For me, this is kind of how it was for me is, is it wasn't so much tactical. Where do I move my troops as much like that, that played into it. But it was like, like what would decide if I won a war or not was how much I researched the, the, my opponent beforehand, mm. how well I knew which allies they had and which people I could call in for help and stuff like that. So like, um, uh, and that, that's usually what would trip me up with the combat is if I didn't do that. And then all of a sudden this person pulls like 5,000 men out of nowhere. Like, oh, I didn't realize they were allied with Hungary, you know, yeah. a kingdom that's five times as big as me. So, uh, <laughs> oops, bummer. <laughs> I'm going to lose this war. <laughs> Get told off by another child. Um, but <laughs> like, so that was, that was where the, the challenge kind of rose for me, which was a learning experience and it was kind of cool for me to be able to continue to learn and grow. So, um, yeah, that, that was kind of my take on it. I, I didn't engage with a lot of the systems with it though. Like I didn't really know how castles and fortresses work and I only kind of understood how troops and stuff work. Right. Um, so I don't understand all of it. 
Um, but I was able to have some fun with it. It was also challenging for a while and frustrating for a while. Like for a bit, I was like, this is stupid. I can't win a war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I think that I, I don't understand the combat system completely yet. Um, mm -hmm. And, and so, yeah, <laughs> which, uh, you know, and I've played the game for a fair amount and I've even read like, how do I be good at war, you know, online? Um, <laughs> but there's a lot there that's kind of like, I don't know, you do have to keep terrain in mind. You have to keep fortifications in mind. You have to keep troop movement in mind. You have to think about what your army is composed of. It's just so much, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so it's, it, it's just, and it's not something that you can learn like super quickly, kind of like you can learn a lot of the rest of the game. You uh -huh. know? Yeah. I, I almost yeah. feel like there needed to be a separate combat tutorial. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. um, it kind of showed you like, here's how you raise up armies. Here's, you can build your army this way. And then you go to war. But the actual going to war thing was kind of brushed over. Um, I feel like it almost <laughs> yeah, needed it was... a separate. Okay, here's. A situation where you're in the middle of this army here's what the odds look like here are things that affect it here's movement because I, I would struggle with movement i i, I get called mm. to this war and it's like oh your allies need help it's like okay where are my allies at i'm seeing all these different armies and like uh -huh. you know when i'm calling the war i can you know kind of tell allies to go different places but in this one's like where do you want me to go? This is your war. I, I guess i'll go here. <laughs> I died. Okay, bad move like <laughs> It it takes a little bit of that action and response away. There was this war I got into near the end of the game where it said the enemy I was attacking had a vastly inferior army that I had allies helping me with the war and I got destroyed. And I don't <laughs> know why. <laughs> oh, and, yeah. 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 And so, yeah, either. There just need to be an entire different combat tutorial. And that could have even just been a thing where it's like you do your tutorial, you know, do your thing. And then in the middle of a game, you could have a tab that was like, go through the combat tutorial or mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess it pauses the game. It's it's a little clunky. Maybe that's not why. But I, I always felt like it was. It was, it was kind of its own thing, but at the same time not enough of its own thing to really engage me in the way that it wanted me to. Mm. Uh, mm. And, and it almost just felt like kind of random whether I won or lost a war. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, re I, I really don't understand it all that mm. well. I'm starting to get pieces of it. I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Crossing a river to attack is a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> And oops, <laughs> and I, I wonder if the game wants you to engage with it that way. If the game wants you to fail a lot and go, all right, and really, really think about mm. it. Like, you have to become a good strategist if you want to win wars in Crusader Kings, because similarly, it asks you to be good at diplomacy if you want to do other things. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't give it to you. It certainly doesn't just give it to you. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't give much to you in that game. Yeah. But, like, if you want to be good, you're going to have to learn things. You're going to have to learn about war, learn principles of warfare. Uh, and maybe, I mean, a tutorial for that would be great. I think so. I think that'd be awesome. And I almost like Aaron's idea a lot about making more of the combat so mm -hmm. that it is enough of its own thing to warrant the engagement that it probably deserves. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Yeah. Like almost a combat so. mini game. Like it turns to like a real time strategy kind of. Yeah. Like a mountain blade kind of a thing. Maybe. Yeah. Um, I, guess I don't know if that really fits strategy, with that game. But, <laughs> but, you know, more Age of Empires type deal. Um, yeah yeah because and, and i and i appreciate the thought that it's something that you can try that you can experience through trial and error that you have to learn the hard mm -hmm. way to strategize but i felt like i didn't have enough parameters to even know what i was supposed to be learning from each experience mm -hmm. yeah that makes um, sense i learned that oh if your allies call you to battle and you're too far away you might not get there in time you know which, which is <laughs> fine but you know, then I learned when you get there, it's like, okay, do I just click on where the armies are at and attack them? Should I siege the places they're they're not? Like, mm. and maybe that's all just strategy. But I didn't even know what strategy was the most advantageous, or you know, like what yeah. resources were involved, 
Or there was one time my army lost, but I still had my commander. And another time my army lost and my commander died. And there wasn't <laughs> yeah. really a separate thing for that. So... Yeah, I, I guess I, I like what you're saying, actually. I like the, the idea that, like, if there's going to be a trial and error process that you're, like, you know, supposed to go through, like, you know, mm -hmm. everything that From Software made, mm -hmm. um, like, you need to be able to identify what went wrong in yeah. order to be able to learn from it yeah. and move on, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, I see what you're saying, that it's, I don't actually know a lot of the time why I lose the battles that I lose in that game. Yeah, same. Um, and there are people who probably do, Mm -hmm. um because you know it, it's just you know people get really into this stuff i haven't figured it out yet but like mm -hmm. yeah um but i haven't and i don't know so and it's not really we're saying that you can't it's that like the way information is presented makes it a little difficult like the, the yeah. trial and error process is made more challenging by the fact that you can't it, that is difficult to figure out yeah what it was that's going wrong yeah or like what mistakes you made or when yeah. stuff's outside of your control it's it's about the way information is presented. And it's about you know what you know you can interact with and, and things yeah. like that. Maybe if it just gave you like a post battle report whenever you lost, and it's like, hey, this is why you lost. Mm. You know, that'd like, be really yeah. interesting. Maybe think about this next time. Gives you a suggestion or something like that. You know, um, I don't know. Yeah, you get a, a letter to your marshal. It's like that was a poor execution of this war. Might I suggest from your allies <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, might I suggest this and that? Yeah. Yeah. Because there's even times, too, like, the amount of troops I had versus the amount that were I could use, like, didn't seem to be the same. Or, mm. you know, when I say raise up all armies, it's like, okay, I've had the same size army this entire time, even though I've been gaining more land. Like, what's, what's going on? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I can accept that it could be something where if you knew every aspect of the game, every facet, it could be a really engaging, enjoyable, strategic thing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But by the end of our playthrough, I feel like I had a pretty good understanding about a lot of the other systems. Yeah. And combat was still a pretty big mystery to me and one that I wanted to engage in because it was one of the major things that invoked change in the game that allowed yeah. you to expand yeah. your kingdom, that allowed different circumstances to happen mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. of just a progression of time. Uh, but then mm -hmm. one I didn't want to engage in because I, yeah, I just felt like I didn't have enough control over it or knew enough about it to engage in, in interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. That is really interesting. That's really thought provoking. I enjoy that. Mm hmm. Well, Aaron, do you want to? Uh, is there anything else you want to bring up in the next couple minutes before we go over to Nick? Um, yeah, they, they just a, a follow-up question with the mm -hmm. kind of systems you, you see in this game. Um, not even the systems. I, I think one of the unique things we, we talked about with this game was kind of its its legacy idea. In that, yeah. you know, your character dies, and then his his son continues, and his son, you know, this generational thing. Uh, is there any way that you would like to or could even see that kind of legacy system being implemented in other types of games? Oh, man. <laughs> wow. Like, so you mean like specifically like the... Oh, go ahead, Aaron. What were you going to say? Yeah, I don't know. Like Skyrim, your character dies and you have a kid that can pick up and... <laughs> that would be awesome. That would be so cool. <laughs> I think... If you're going to achieve that, you got to go the Crusader King. This is my totally unprofessional opinion because I don't know. But um, I feel like if you're going to achieve that, you've got to go the Crusader King's route and make it procedural because you're never going to have infinite authored content. Mm. So like something like Skyrim would have to be more procedural, I think, if it was to warrant staying in the game yeah, and replaying things that much. Yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. But, no, you, but I... But I it would be weird if you are playing Skyrim and then you, uh, you know, you see all these kids running around in Whiterun or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have your own kid and then you die and then you start playing as your own kid. And like the kids that in Whiterun are the same age as they were <laughs> when your dad was a kid. <laughs> That'd be weird. And so I, I, I think I agree with you, Nick. That does need to be a certain amount of like. Yeah. That, that would almost just be just kind of a permadeath thing. Otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And except for you're now restarting as a weaker character. Uh, yeah. But then maybe you don't have to do the Skyrim tutorial sections. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, maybe it is worth it. <laughs> maybe it is. Maybe it is worth it. You're right. Oh, my goodness. Um, but but I really like the legacy thing that happens in Crusader Kings. And yeah. I think that this is kind of one of the big draws for me to a lot of simulation style games like this one mm -hmm. or The Sims or, you know, something like that. Like you can, it's fun to see how your decisions, you know, several generations ago are still affecting the world. You know, mm -hmm. the whole butterfly effect in action kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In whatever way that that happens, but yeah, it's it's awesome. It's a really cool effect. I really like it. I mean, it takes that whole choice and consequence thing that we all love so much to the next level because you're not just seeing consequences no. here; you're seeing consequences generations down the line. Yeah, like, and Crusader Kings are like, wow, you know, I'm king of this place now because my great grandfather, you know, conquered Hungary or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. some really far-reaching consequences. Yeah. Or like, yeah, my, or my great grandfather bungled this diplomatic situation, yeah. and now I lost half of what would have been my inheritance. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I yeah, I love the legacy effect that mm -hmm. happens in this game. It's it's really fun. I would love to see that all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> we also didn't even use it. Like we we all like played through our first character and then stopped. Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Already, I could see some tensions at the end of that game. Though it was like, oh well, my character who's died his wife really doesn't like my son and so mm -hmm. like, see a lot of tension coming from that and yeah uh, mm -hmm. these other kids who don't really have land and oh now it seems like their opinion of my son now that he's king is going down like what's going to happen yeah yeah um, okay and you're right I, I i think there is something unique about crusader kings about the type of procedural strategy type game that makes the legacy idea work that may not work so well if you just tacked it onto some third person rpg or some uh yeah uh, action game um but i i think if I you just build it with that in mind it'll be fine mm -hmm. yeah i don't think it's yeah, like it's, you can't have a third person action thing, game. like if i did see like a big i don't know triple a game <laughs> with that in place i'd be very intrigued to see you know how it works or how mm -hmm. it works. yeah no. Yeah, I, I feel like it'd be a thing that would kind of feel tacked on and not really work. Like almost something like the new Watch Dogs game, where mm -hmm. almost you know every NPC in that game is a playable character, and if you die, you know that character's dead, and you kind of move on to something else. But how in that game, it's it's not super integrated into the story, so it's a little tacked on. But like going mm -hmm. forward, I can see that building more. I, I I feel like that if something like this were implemented in some other style of games. Mm -hmm. uh, Eventually, it, it could be something really cool. I, I think it's a fun thing that sh should be experimented with. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. We should get to the Nick segment anyway, of our yeah. thing. Nick. No, but, uh, awesome. Thank you, Aaron. That was good stuff. I, that was a fascinating conversation. Right yeah, there. no kidding. All right, Nick's turn. All right. So I've got a question. Um, here's my question. So in the tutorial for Crusader Kings Three, uh, it says it, make, it makes a bold claim. It says there's no way to win. Um, and I want to know how you felt about that. How did knowing that there was no one victory condition affect your experience? Uh, and did you, I mean, did you feel like that was true? What was your experience with that? Um, Gosh. So, yeah, knowing that, yeah, what I just said, that's my question. I'm not going <laughs> to expand on it <laughs> yet. Uh, Man, I don't yeah, even I think, think about there were. Like one thing to win, like if you were just playing this really complicated game of risk, mm. and, uh, you know, just conquer the world. Uh, I think it would take away with with from kind of the uh, the things we were talking about, the little random idiosyncrasies and the feeling of control. Uh, yeah. I think the clock <laughs> of the game would be much more stressful if there was a specific mm -hmm. objective you were trying to achieve uh, in that mm -hmm. time. Um, I think uh, I, I don't even know how they could keep the legacy thing if there was an objective, because if there's an objective, there's an ending, you know? Mm -hmm. So if it's like, oh, if in a thousand years you don't have this much land or <laughs> you don't have this, 
Yeah. Uh-huh. You lose. It, yeah. It, it's really kind of antithetical to everything else in the game to have an end objective, mm-hmm. a, a kind of a measuring rod to all mm-hmm. of these random and creative decisions you're making. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do believe that. Um, I think the game will run to like the fourteen to fifteen hundreds or something, and then it will stop because you know it's a game about the medieval. It doesn't have world. modern technology, so <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, the Crusader Kings three just wouldn't work mm-hmm. if it was twenty twenty. You know, yeah, it's just a completely different game with completely different mechanics. Yeah. At that point, <laughs> you'd have to deal with uh, COVID instead of the bubonic plague and you know all, <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah, uh, but um. And I think that there is some kind of score system that I just don't pay attention to. I don't know. Maybe that maybe that was more a thing in previous mm-hmm. in, the, in the other game. I don't remember actually. But mm-hmm. does it really say there's no it's, way it to says, win? There's no way to win this game. Oh That's, man, it says so it's like one of the first blurbs that you read. I, I wish I had it in front of me so I could read it, but I remember that distinctly. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. I don't yeah. think I am. Though. I'm pretty sure I read that. Um, and regardless. I feel like it's kind of the way it presents itself. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you feel like you needed a clear objective written out in front of you in order to make decisions and have meaningful choices and have fun with the game? Oh, no. No, I don't even think about winning. I just think about what, how do I manage these people in my court? How do I manage this family that I have? And how do I keep everybody roughly happy? And Mm -hmm. I'm very much in the moment with this game. Mm -hmm. I'm very much like, what am I dealing with right now? you know, now, and I might be like looking ahead a few years to like, oh, maybe I can conquer Britain Mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, but like, but for the most part, I think I'm just like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on the role playing (laughs) or or the Mm -hmm. strategy stuff that's happening right now, right in front of me. Yeah. You, you you choose your own objectives. Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's, it's kind of like a tabletop RPG, you know, it's like, we, uh, we, we, we play Dungeons and Dragons together. And when we do that, Mm -hmm. You know, you can obviously we we win or lose certain I don't know combat scenarios, or you know maybe our character dies. But if a character dies, you make a new character and you continue on, and the story's mm-hmm. as long as you want it to be, and as long as people are able to play it for. And yeah, uh, yeah, it's not really a woo. You won the game. Like it's you're just you're <laughs> yeah. creating this narrative. You're creating this story. You're engaging in the systems that are available in whatever way is most fun to you. Um, yeah, and I think in Crusader Kings, if a game started telling you what to do, um, mm-hmm. it, it would it would it would it would immediately fight against that. Uh, if mm-hmm. it was like, oh well, I'm gonna have this, I, I'm gonna put my sights onto Hungary and taking over Hungary because I like what they have here, 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 and then the game was like, no, you need to take over England. If you don't take over England, you lose. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I yeah. On England, England's fine. Like it's, uh. You know, and obviously this isn't saying games that have an objective, you know, are, in, are inferior. We, we're talking about this as a different type of game. But with what the game is, I think, um, yeah, it was very smart not to have a win or lose thing. Like, can you imagine if you had this really interesting story with your family, kind of this tragedy and almost this, like, you know, Shakespearean transfer of power and these things, but yeah. mm-hmm. you didn't conquer the right places or have enough wealth or influence by the end of the game, and it was like you lose. You know? <laughs> yeah. The moment, like the moment you introduce a win state, you introduce infinite lose states. Like mm. uh, the what a way to put it. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's just anything that you. Any any non optimal strategy is wrong, and you're playing the game wrong at that point. Wow. Um, but it wants you to have the freedom to do all kinds of crazy different things. Yeah, and, and so I, I think you're right. Yeah, if they had said this is how you win the game, you wouldn't have done all those mm-hmm. fun things because it wouldn't have been the best way to play to yeah. win. You know? Yeah. Um, we we talked about this a little bit. Um. I think we talked about The Witcher last time, how there's these decisions mm-hmm. in the game, but then there are also endings that are clearly bad that, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. don't really seem to go, you know, with how you played. Um, and I played this game one time that, that I think demonstrates this as well. Um, and I think I talked about this in one of the podcasts, I think one of the lost podcasts we have. Uh, <laughs> but the game Oxenfree, you have 
all these dialogue choices throughout the the game and all these relationships that you kind of build and maintain and keep and you go on this really interesting sci-fi adventure and by the end you know you feel this close connection to these other characters and then you can still get an ending where it's like oh yeah i never see this person anymore oh yeah they don't write me yeah, that person kind of fell off. It's like, what? Like, how would this happen if we had this experience <laughs> together? And so uh-huh. it seems to, yeah, kind of kick back against the story you were trying to make. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And then it makes you, you know, I, when I felt the game, I kind of resented it. And was like, oh, you're saying that this story I was creating with these characters was not valid because it, I didn't do this, this, and this to get the quote-unquote good ending, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if Crusader Kings had a good ending, <laughs> good, yeah, uh, you know, it's like, oh, you have to, it's Crusader Kings, so there's the crusade, and you have to win the crusade and be king of all this area in mm-hmm. order to win. Uh, you know, and if you didn't do that, if some, I don't know, things happened that invalidated your story, uh, yeah, it would, like, throw the entire game away. I think it would, yeah. Yeah. Miss the point, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, that, that is an interesting. Um, good question. Thanks. You know, honestly, I didn't have much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. No, thanks. Um, is this kind of? I mean, if you if you don't please. have any thing else you want to say right now, no, I mean, you're good. It, it kind of reminds me of the struggles that we run into when we're making board games. Mm-hmm. You know, because we we try our hands at design frequently, mm-hmm. and like you can't make a board game the same way that you can make a video game you know Mm -hmm. um you can't say oh yeah well you know it's just a long form game where you play you know 60 hours (laughs) it it, it doesn't work as well um and and i think that every time we've run into the thing every time we've tried to make a board game we've run into that do we have a goal because it kind of ruins all of them the because as soon as you have a goal then you start optimizing you play it a certain way to get yeah. Yeah, all the all the all the fun of role playing and of of uh being in the moment and everything like it it kind of takes a back seat or or goes on the back burner and you just forget about it in some cases and don't even engage with it at all. Mm-hmm. Um whereas a game like Crusader Kings like no, that's like we're focused on the whole time, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, so. Yeah. And I don't think that it's impossible to make a board game that makes you feel like you're in the moment yeah. as much, but like yeah. It's it's been difficult. Yeah, yeah, that that is a challenge we frequently run into. Yeah. Well, and, I think the thing, um, yeah. like Crusader Kings, is a simulation. You know, more than yeah. a game with an objective, it's a simulation. It's a sandbox. It's a, mm-hmm. you know, kind of create your world thing. Um, mm-hmm. And I so, so I think that's a distinction too. Almost, you know, it's almost not a game in 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 the traditional sense. Um, and I was wondering, I, ha- I haven't played it as much, but I understand. So another s- simulation game is Minecraft. You guys talk about it a lot. Mm. Yeah. Isn't there like a story with an ending and like a winning losing in that game? Oh yeah, we did that recently. Yeah, we did. It was uh trivial. <laughs> <laughs> a footnote in the grander adventure that has been Minecraft. That's kind of the way I saw it, honestly. Yeah, it was kind of like, because like the main, I there's no real characters or anything it's just like there's this idea that you go out and kill this dragon and it's hard to get there and then it's hard to fight it and then it's over and then the credits roll and um uh (laughs) we did it and then we got back to work (laughs) you know it was like okay well let's go let's go kill this dragon because it'll be interesting and we've never done it before so we did it and then Mm-hmm. Yeah. life goes on we killed the dragon and there's more to do and the, the more interesting part of the game over here uh-huh. um, almost, and that's, uh, almost like an event thing in a like a free-to-play game like, <laughs> yeah like you're, you're, you're playing your own thing and now oh here's a special event objective you do it yeah. and continue uh-huh. on with yeah and that's not to say everyone plays minecraft that way i do know of people who play minecraft to win which i'm not gonna lie that upsets me that idea <laughs> Like kind of. Well, they're Minecraft speedruns. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, like yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I see what you mean. Yeah. It's really hard to see like this simulation game with infinite possibilities, and then like there's only one way to play this, and I have to get through it as fast as possible. <laughs> it's like, oh. 
but you're missing all of this beautiful opportunity to get invested in this world and to build these beautiful things and to explore and experiment. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So do you think that takes away from that game or does that add an experience? If, if somebody just wants a straightforward narrative objective, they can still have that in the middle of this larger simulation. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, like, See, the thing is that the narrative itself isn't really that terribly satisfying, I don't think. The yeah. only thing that happens is the credits roll. Like, that's the only way you define that the game is. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, maybe if it had just... I think that if you want a good narrative experience, it's probably better if you make a game that is focused on a narrative experience, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, we talk about game focus and games being about specific experiences and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, but uh, no, I just yeah, wonder yeah. if you could have something in Crusader Kings with you have this mm. other story going on, but then you have the option to engage in this more focus-driven narrative section of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Yeah, that you know has a specific resolution, but you know whether you win or lose or, or complete it, you're still back in. I don't know this other world that you're created. I don't even know if that works mm. with it, but. I, I, don't, I don't even know what that would look like. Yeah, me neither. No, it's a, it's it's a, really, a good really good question. Good question. Oh, man, I don't know. I want to I think about that. Me too. Man. If it was like, I mean, it's Crusader Kings. If it's like, oh, you can engage in the actual Crusades. And when that happens, it's a bit more led or a bit more, I don't even know, directed. Maybe just more limited of what you can do. Um did we not get to the Crusades? I don't think we made it to the Crusades. I don't think we lived long enough to see the Crusades. In our, in our play, that's really funny. Oh, man. But, you're, but you are right, Aaron. Like, it's not a very narrative experience. It basically is like any other war, except that the Pope is the guy who's calling in all the allies, you know, mm-hmm. um, or, um, or whoever it is you're fighting against. Also, he can declare Crusades, basically, like, later on in the game, he can declare Crusades on, like, any place that isn't Catholic. Mm-hmm. So there was, like, this... Uh, Lollardy faction in England in one of my playthroughs, and he declared war on them, and the entire Christian world comes down on these like three counties in England. <laughs> in England. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so wow. it's just it's just like a regular war. It's not a narrative style thing or whatever. It is. It's one of those historical guardrail type of things, you know, that like happens at certain points. But yeah, yeah. I, I guess just I bring that up because the original question was, you know, yeah. if a win or lose thing, you know, would affect, expect our experience of Crusader thing, or, or what did we feel when we saw that there was no way to win? Yeah. Um, and it was like, just maybe a possibility of a way they could implement a more objective driven aspect of it without taking away from the rest of the game. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah. Like I not for know. better or for worse, but just. If they could, if they could. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, I really don't know. Yeah, it's something I'll be thinking about. Yeah, yeah. that's that's pretty much my question. I don't know if you guys have much more to add. No, th- thank you. That's a good question. Um, yeah. And, and Aaron asked a really good question, yeah, too. That I don't yeah, yeah, I kind of hijacked your question there. But, oh, no, um, it's totally fine. Yeah, it's a fascinating discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so much. Yeah. I'm really grateful we were able to play this game together. Like again, me too. It's uh, you know, I I think it's a great game on its own, but the fact that the three of us were able to experience it at the same time, I think, was something uh, that really elevated it for me. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the fact that you know we've got some video on it and can look back at the video and remember those moments and those experiences. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just think that's awesome. It's so cool. It's a special, unique experience. You know. Mm-hmm. One that we will never have again because of its ephemeral nature and everything. Yeah, know? which in a lot of ways just makes it cooler, I think. Which yeah. is cool, well, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, well, I mean, do you want to have another ephemeral experience? It's yeah. still there. You can still do it. It's, it's just, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's not like you, you can never have a good experience again. Yeah. <laughs> you should never have that exact one again. Right. So, yeah. yeah I mean, that's kind of what... if we, the games that we want to replay, like, we usually do something different with it, you know? Like, you can yeah. replay Skyrim, but play it a completely different way, or at least uh, 
you know, make different decisions. Like the reason we want to replay something is usually to do something different. Mm. So the fact that the entire game can be different. Yeah. That's, yeah. That yeah. Sense. I, the Crusader Kings, I think is really quite special. Uh, and I think it does some things that just, I, I've got so much respect for, I appreciate the, the, uh, the boldness, the way it gets rid of some things that are just, you know, like a win state. Mm. Um, I appreciate that so much, and I appreciate um, so many of the design decisions that let it be unique. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah, I think it's really cool. It's so it's so very much its own thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what genre is Crusader Kings? And I mean, like, yeah, you can say it's a grand strategy game, or you could say it's the the paradox genre. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. but like. But you know, <laughs> it's just yeah. it's so distinct and so different. Yeah. And I was really glad that I had I'm glad that we um came up with this idea to do uh uh special episodes where we all play the same game because I wasn't gonna be able to get anyone else to play this game with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it so much and I wanted to be able to do it with friends and, and so uh for I the good of the happy. podcast, we would do it with you. Yeah. <laughs> right. I the Holy think, Roman Emperor, or em, em, oh gosh, Empire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we did. I'm glad that we had that experience. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for those this, uh, discussion questions. That was really good. Um, mm -hmm. I we talked about combat tutorial. Um, we talked about characterization, procedural people. Talked about objectives and end states and win states, and mm -hmm. that was all really good stuff. Um, fascinating stuff that is relevant to many other games as well mm -hmm. so that's cool all right yeah. listeners thank you again for listening to games by design um we'll be taking a break until january and when we return we'll be back to our usual format and aaron will be taking up the lead for the next discussion about game design woot woot mm -hmm. um the special episode game that we'll be playing next month and discussing is 2019's Outer Wilds mm -hmm. by Mobius Digital. That's correct. Uh, which is an action adventure game in space where something fishy is going in. And you got to figure out what the fish is. What uh, <laughs> what does the not fish is. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, the so... fish is going on here? <laughs> so join us next month to find out what the fish is going on. Join us. <laughs> In outer wild. So, so yeah, the I mean, fish in the outer wild. <laughs> <laughs> this fishing game, um, space fishing game. <laughs> so Nick, you're the only one who's played it. Do you want to say I anything am. to plug it? Sure. Um, as a recommendation, I freaking love this game. <laughs> you fishing um, love it. I fishing love this game. <laughs> no, I, uh, I've been wanting people to talk to about it, and so it, for many of the same reasons that you want to play <laughs> Crusader Kings, um, I'm really excited to hear what both you and Aaron uh, have to say about it. Um, I think it's a really unique experience. I, um, I think it, yeah, I love this game. I love this game a lot. That's really what it boils down to. Um, and I'm excited to revisit it um, and to have a discussion about what makes it work and, and how cool it is uh, and maybe what things could be better. So um, yeah. If you want to play with us, do it. Yeah. You can find it yeah. on a number of services. It is through to the end of the year. It is on sale on Epic Games right now. Ooh, oh, yeah. perfect. Well, that's another couple of weeks. People could grab it. Yeah. And if uh, all goes according to schedule, we will uh, we'll be talking about that episode or talking about that game in our episode uh, at the very end of January. So mm -hmm. um, yeah. sweet. Yeah, and hopefully, uh, like hopefully we're going to try some videos with that one, too. It's it's not one that we'll be playing together, but maybe just some of our own individual screen capture. Uh, just yeah. to have a bit of a visual reference uh, that you can go to for what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. We'll see how that goes. Yeah, give it a try. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, guys. And uh, to our listeners, happy holidays. Travel safe. Don't drive sloshed or drunk. <laughs> Or fished. Or, or don't fished. try fished. Don't try fished. <laughs> or don't fish drunk. Don't fish. Yeah. Or don't, don't fish yeah. while driving.
Don't let the fish drive. <laughs> maybe the moral. <laughs> maybe the moral of this outro is uh, don't podcast drunk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, that's all. That's all for this year. See you next time in 2021. Adios. Happy 2020. Happy 2020. Bye. Bye. Bye.